Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. And I'm delighted to be here, and uh, it was uh, very nice to get the invitation, but I was a little nervous. Um, the audience here is so diverse, and really a, a little away from the normal audience that I address. But since I've been here, I've been hugely encouraged, because I've met lots of enthusiastic people saying, ah, oh, yes, I can see how your technology can fit our needs. I can see how our materials can be used in your technology and so uh, hopefully I'm going to be able to entertain you for the next hour with some possibilities both for using your technologies and your knowledge in uh, my area but also applying the sorts of devices and approaches that we've been experimenting with uh, in uh, your area but it does take a little bit of imagination you're going to have to link a little bit what I'm going to talk across to your uh, your areas. But I'm going to uh, look then at tools that you may be able to use. I'm going to look at instrumentation that you can adapt for your uses. And perhaps most excitingly for me, I'm going to look at uh, some of the possibilities for new materials and looking around the place, listening to a few of the talks, looking at the posters, I can see lots of exciting materials that uh, could be applied in the sorts of approaches I'm going to talk about. And I'm also going to talk about new methods to probe and reveal fundamental mechanisms, fundamental biochemistry and physiology. But more than anything, I'm going to tell you the fascinating story uh, about the emergence and development of biosensors. So uh, hopefully bear with me and use some imagination uh, as, we, uh, as we go through. Firstly, I'm just going to uh, like to put up this slide to, uh, by way of uh, acknowledgement uh, and acknowledge some of the key people in my team. I have a, now a small but dedicated and enthusiastic uh, team of researchers, and I'd like to mention some of the work, some of the people that have driven the work uh, that I will refer to today. Uh, firstly, there's uh, Alina Sekretariova, who's driven the uh, single molecule sensing that I will finish up with. There's Valeria Benny, who has driven the work on printable electronics and the ability to make instruments on pieces of paper that I will describe. There's uh, Lokman uh, uh, Zun uh, and uh, Edoran uh, uh, um, uh, Ozkan, uh, who have uh, worked on the molecular imprinted polymers uh, and also on the synthetic protein work that I will talk about. Uh, and uh, Mikhail Vargas. Uh, who again has worked on the electrochemistry side, and Ashutosh Tiwari, who has driven the smart polymer work. And obviously there's many other people as well involved, but those were some of the key people that I will be uh, mentioning their work uh, through this talk. It's a small team, but we are very keen to drive the Nordic region towards sense of realization in many different areas. So, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so what am I going to talk about today in detail? Well, I've got this rather pretentious title, How to Achieve the Ultimate in Performance with the Simplest of Devices. And the uh, simplest of device to exploit that I think mankind as a species has discovered over many millennia is living systems. Easy to exploit, but more difficult to understand. And the work I'm going to talk about is the idea of biosensors harnessing living systems together with microelectronics and electronic systems to make simple, easy to use measurement devices to reveal uh, information that is essential to our understanding. Um, so I've used this term frictionless uh, information. That's the idea of sharing or moving information seamlessly across uh, disciplines and across areas to take advantage advantage of big data to take advantage of measurement and real-time measurement and to mix all that together to give us the maximum output. And this is really taking hold in the clinical field and a lot of what I'm going to try to convey today is the advances in the clinical field that can be technologically transferred across to uh, the uh, environmental side uh, and uh, the uh, ecological uh, studies that are perhaps more central to uh, this meeting. <laughs> 
So I'll talk about what biosensors are, what the role of biosensors are. Uh, I will specifically look at enzymes coupled uh, to systems, in particular electrodes. I will look at affinity systems, antibodies, DNA, detecting genetic mutations, etc., um, and uh, using uh, uh, single-stranded DNA, using aptamers, uh, using uh, other re synthetic receptor molecules. I will consider some of the advanced functions materials that we've been developing and others have been developing, especially biohybrid materials where we've been trying to combine the properties of biology with the advantages of synthetic chemistry and the stability of these systems. And I will finish with a little bit of work that we've just published on uh, single molecule detection, the first ever report of single molecule detection using electrochemistry as opposed to uh, the optics that have been uh, around for uh, a little while. But I'm going to begin then with a few uh, general statements and a few uh, or, um, uh, of uh, uh, observations. I'll begin here. And I've called this, you all have heard, I think, of the term now, the Internet of Things. And I've titled this slide, The Internet of Living Things. The idea of interconnecting information about life. And some of the pictures on this slide I've used uh, in my lectures on ethics and uh, uh, teaching the students about perhaps the limits of uh, where science should and shouldn't be applied. And the picture over on the left is an interesting example that I took from the uh, popular press uh, a, a couple of years ago, three years ago now. Uh, and uh, you see the idea there of uh, people aspiring to be bionic by implanting mobile phones in themselves and uh, I uh, really use that as an example of a step too far uh, and uh, these are body, so-called body artists who are into uh, various uh, uh, piercings and the like that are uh, implanting these devices in themselves. A more serious uh, piece of work over here from Cambridge Life Sciences, uh, Cambridge Design rather, sorry, in the UK in Cambridge um, is for military applications and monitoring uh, the vital signs of soldiers during battle and uh, the implications of that, I mean, uh, looking for their welfare but also looking to see uh, whether it's worth rendering any aid if they're shot or, or injured or whether just to leave them and uh, move resources elsewhere. So it gives you, again, some interesting ethical uh, per uh, uh, permutations. And then the popular press, of course, over here represented. And uh, this, I, I think, highlights two things, some of the possible future, and we're used to the press uh, uh, giving us an idea of what the future may, uh, uh, may uh, hold for us without perhaps always having the full scientific basis behind it. But I've been a little disturbed recently to see similar things appearing on university websites uh, where uh, we seem to be letting the press office get the upper hand these days and make promises that we sometimes can't keep yet. Uh, so uh, I do caution against that, and I, I was particularly worried recently to see some uh, continuous monitoring promised for certain diseases where patients were replying online, yes, I must have that now, and of course we were raising expectations that we cannot meet. So there's caution, I think, and uh, uh, we must be careful as scientists when we try to communicate our science to the public, that's very good, but let's not exaggerate, let's be careful, and let's be real about what we say. So after all that lesson and preaching, of course, there I was saying, all this, of course, is not here yet. And then uh, what do I find when I travel on our Swedish national train system, SE, which some of you will have had the pleasure to travel on, and I came here on, and I see that we have now implantable chips. Uh, tickets now that are implanted uh, in uh, the, uh, this part of your hand, and that carries your ticket information, your access to the lounge if you're lucky enough to have it uh, and so on and so forth and uh, this was, uh, I discovered just last month in, in, or, or two months ago now, at the end of May um, that this is an option for me to travel on my train with my implantable chip so maybe things are coming forward a little faster than I was thinking and uh, people in particular are more willing 
than I imagined to have these implantable devices. So I think we're opening up uh, a very interesting era and interesting possibilities. When we look at, then at the idea of wearable and implantable sensing and measurement, this has now been recognized in recent years as a major opportunity. This is one commercial report. I don't uh, specifically recommend the report as a whole, but it's a, uh, interesting, some interesting observations in it. You'll all be familiar with the sort of sports watches that one can buy now to monitor, self-monitor a number of parameters, and you can see all the clever things that have been monitored uh, and uh, using various sensors and then often secondary information derived from those physical sensors, those wearable sensors, uh, leading us to some very valuable uh, information. But the thing I take from this report in particular is the statement there about measuring the aspects of blood chemistry or more specifically biochemistry. Because what we really want to know is about our proteomic, genomic, metabolomic activity, sometimes, not always, but often in real time, and to understand the bodies and living systems' interactions with their environment, with the food we eat, uh, and uh, with the uh, general stimuli that we receive. And that is a much more difficult challenge. The sort of wearables we see now are basically the low-hanging fruit. They're the easy stuff. They've taken the sense that are effectively off the shelf and applied them with clever algorithms, clever apps to get these pieces of information. But we really need chemical and biochemical sensors to get at the essential information for living systems. And that's where biosensors come in and what my talk is about, trying to access that chemical, biochemical uh, information that's so crucial to understanding uh, living systems. Now, the idea, of course, of measuring living systems has been around for a long time, and biosensors themselves have a long history. They go back to 1962, the first report of a biosensor by Leyland C. Clark, and you will be familiar with the oxygen electrode, which I see used widely in your sort of work. It's the same Clark, the Clark oxygen electrode, uh, and this is the Clark that he, uh, 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 10 years after he developed the oxygen electrode, or well, actually not 10, six years after he developed the oxygen electrode, uh, he invented the uh, enzyme electrode and uh, published that in the annuals of New York Academy of Sciences. So the field has been around for a long time and growing, but at the moment there are some key drivers coming together and I think that sometimes I describe this as a perfect storm of events. Not only science and technology and need, but also political will and financial pressure, which is causing perhaps a step change and uh, a catastrophic uh, positive uh, uh, move towards sensing and uh, measurement. And so what are some of these changes? Well, of course, the changes are being driven by the health sector, and that's where the funding is principally going in, but all of this technology, or most of it, is transferable across to uh, other sectors, as I'll uh, try to illustrate. Now, some of the drivers, then, that are making health monitoring so topical at the moment is, first, of course, the thing that drives most things in countries and politics is money. Uh, and the expenditure on health care is mushrooming uncontrollably. Basically, I seldom see anywhere in the world a government that has managed to think what they're going to do in 20 or 30 years' time. Everybody's short-term, and even the most far-thinking countries don't really have a proper plan as to how to deal with management of health in our population uh, in uh, the decades uh, to come. And there's just a few figures here that I've taken from uh, some of the latest OECD uh, numbers that GD the percentage of, healthcare sp of GDP spelt on healthcare is mushrooming in the United States, 16.9%, Sweden here, 11.1%, uh, the UK, 9.8%. Of course, these figures go up and down uh, with currency changes and so on and so forth. But you get the idea. It's big spending and it's going up. Exactly how fast it's going up is debatable, but it is always going 
coming up. And we get these difficult political choices, you know, to, when you try to rationalize hospital, hospital provision, for example, local communities get very upset about it. And uh, you've got to think about how to deal with this and how to do things uh, efficiently. But we've got to do things differently. We cannot afford it. Um, then there are some other pressures coming along at the moment. Uh, we talked, I showed you the sports watches that are out there. The idea of uh, individual choice and measurement is becoming much more popular. Not everybody wants to measure themselves, and of course these sports watches have not been a, a quite as big a success as some of the commercial investors had hoped, but there is a trend towards people getting more interested in their data. There's of course also the internet generation now when you go to your physician you don't just go and say what's wrong with me you often go and say I've looked this up and I think I've got this what do you think you know the, the whole relationship is changing between the average person's grasp of data and information and their ownership uh, of that data they're also of course asking questions about who owns my data you know does they do I own it does the government own it do the insurance companies own it do research companies own it all these big, difficult questions, but nevertheless, it's being discussed. Then we have another pressure around at the moment, the idea of consumer-driven delivery and uh, a relatively new term, evidence-based reimbursement. Uh, not so long ago, a new term came in called evidence-based medicine, and it always struck me as very strange that medicine had been, not been based on evidence previously. But now we have evidence-based reimbursement, which means if it doesn't work, we don't pay. Uh, and this is a new paradigm. We see it with hip replacements and so on now, where national purchasing systems are saying various medical devices have to have a certain lifetime or they have to be reimbursed. And increasingly, consumers are getting the hang of this and saying, hang on, I want to pay to get better, not to pay to be treated. Moreover, we have the issue of decentralization. The idea that, first of all, it's not cost effective to deliver health care in cent big centralized facilities for many uh, conditions and many uh, uh, things that need to be delivered. And often it's not convenient. Even in Sweden, we have rural communities that are uh, distant from central facilities. And of course, if you get out to China, India, and so on, you find find not even rudimentary facilities available to some people in some parts of the world. And the idea of being able to decentralize and automate or, and use telecommunications to deliver health and monitoring and, and uh, care uh, are really gaining traction, but also gaining traction from the politicians because it's perceived as potentially cheaper as well as more effective and more convenient. So it's a win-win there. Another term that not so long ago I had to actually explain what it meant, personalized medicine, is now in the newspapers. Everybody talks about personalized medicine. Again, a peculiar transformation because it seems that it's taken us millennia to discover that everybody's different and that you can't give the, the same person, to different people the same treatment and expect the same results. We're now realizing that one person taking a drug has a different reaction to another person. And of course, if you're going to personalize delivery of uh, medicines and treatments, then you need to understand the individual, and that again means measurement. And at the bottom of all of these uh, lists is the idea of mobility. And of course, mobility is also at the heart of many of your demands uh, for monitoring ecosystems and uh, living systems uh, generally. And so what I, my thesis today is to propose to you that the answer is the biosensor. Now, of course, it's not the whole answer, but it is my passion and what I'm here to talk to you about today. And uh, let's have a look then at a bit more detail of what biosensors can do for you and uh, what, they, what they have done. <laughs> 
Now, the biosensor I'm going to talk about is, is, is a formal definition of a biosensor. There's, there's an area of biosensing and there's the biosensor. Now, there's been a lot of debate historically, which I won't go into, uh, but the International, of Euro, 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 International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry has defined the biosensor as an analytical device incorporating a biological element or a biologically derived element. And that's the type of biosensor I'm going to talk about. It's the fusion of the exquisite specificity and sensitivity of living systems with microelectronics and transducers to give you signals and processable data that we can uh, use. And biosensors began life uh, with quite exotic devices. Uh, there, there's a banana trode in the literature, which was slices of banana on an electrode. There are insect antennae and crab antennae mounted on electrodes. But these days, most of our designs are molecular in design, although organisms incorporated in biosensors, microorganisms, are also uh, very important. So we have a range of materials from tissues, microorganisms, enzymes, antibodies, nucleic acids, and variations on the theme, like aptamers and, and uh, 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 antibody fragments and so on. But we also now include uh, chemical mimics of biology, synthetic receptors and so on, and biohybrid materials, which I will also talk about. And then we fuse these, uh, this, this ability to recognize things very sensitively and very specifically with various transducers. The, the dominant ones being electrochemical transducers and optical transducers, but for completion here are the rest, thermometric, piezoelectric, magnetic and micromechanical, but for reasons of economy of time, I shall just talk about electrochemistry and optical devices, which are the main ones. And we couple that up to some uh, electronics to give us a processable signal that we can act upon or uh, perhaps actually tra directly transduce and cause some automatic interaction, such as making an artificial organ or a bionic organ, as it's sometimes called, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, too in a moment. So biosensors then, in a nutshell, harness this immense immensely powerful molecular recognition properties of living systems and engineer them into electronic devices to provide simple, easy to use devices. And that's where the simplest of possible design in the, in the theme of my title comes from. But it is actually very complex to design these things to make them simple. So uh, we have to understand a lot because uh, when you take a GC or a mass spec, you have to do all the development in real time when you're using it. Uh, it but when you make a biosensor, you expect to break it out of the packet and get the answer. And that means a lot of upfront thinking, a lot of upfront design uh, in the device. Um, and we can see biosensors then with the uh, exploitation of uh, the, the, the recognition capability of biology harnessed to electronics used in a variety of applications. Medicine, biomedical research and drug discovery are the ones that have dominated economically so far. But when you look into the research literature, there is also a huge amount of use in environmental monitoring, in food content, quality and safety safety, in process control, which I will mention uh, today, and in security and defense, such as detecting drugs of abuse or detecting biological warfare agents. So um, the literature is much more widely distributed and more uh, equally distributed amongst those areas than the commercial successes, uh, which um, are, are illustrated uh, over on the right here. But the two most successful biosensors, to my mind, uh, in illustrating this simple, easy-to-use philosophy incorporating biological sensing elements are illustrated over here. The com undoubtedly commercially uh, success-wise in terms of 
the amount of sales and amount of money made, then glucose sensors for diabetes has been by far uh, the most successful. And this uh, was work that uh, I, uh, my team pioneered in the UK in the 1980s, and we did a lot of work in collaboration with Oxford University and created the first handheld portable electrochemical biosensors for home monitoring of glucose. Uh, and this was launched in 1987. Um, and I'm going to talk about the glucose story and what we've learned from that and how it's applicable to many other things in a moment. And undoubtedly, you can see these are simple, easy to use devices uh, that children can use, elderly people can use. Basically, an unskilled, untrained person can break this out and get a complex clinical measurement, uh, which is critical to their uh, life and their, their management of their disease. The other example I've given over here has also had huge impact, and this is an affinity device. This, uh, this, the one on the left is electrochemical, the one on the right is optical. Uh, the one on the left costs about $25 US dollars to make, uh, uh, to buy rather, uh, and the one on the right costs $200,000 to buy. So they're very different, but uh, they have the same objective of making complex measurements simple and this is a real-time affinity monitor that allows you uh, for research purposes and for in particular in drug discovery to look at the real-time binding interactions of biological receptors uh, with their target molecules and those receptors may be true receptors as we understand them in uh, 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 cell biology, but also maybe antibodies, uh, single-stranded DNA, uh, uh, artificial materials, and so on. And the technique used here is surface plasmon resonance. And I'm going to talk about both of these. Both of these have a, have a link, a direct link to me, because obviously I developed this one, and uh, the team at uh, the, the, this uh, technology emanated from Linship. University and my colleagues there in the past, uh, so uh, I also can talk about there, that area. So the biosensors area has been a huge area. It's, it's, it's mushroomed, and I've been lucky enough to be in there at the beginning. I moved across the biosensors at the end of the 70s when there were one or two papers published a year, so I could obviously read everything at the time, and uh, last year there were nearly 6,000 papers uh, published, so uh, it's got a little bit more difficult to assimilate the literature now. As I said, um, the, the, the papers are spread across a diverse uh, area, but um, the commercially, uh, the picture has been uh, a little bit different. And if you look at the market for biosensors, then again you see this massive growth, um, a little bit of uh, a slow up with the recession there. That's, that's two effects. One is the obvious effects of a recession, but also the effects of price drops, because I'm measuring here selling price. So if the price dropped, even if the number of devices was going up, then you saw a little bit of a, a flattening uh, of the curve. But now it's a very big market, 15 billion dollars a year. So it's a sizable market. Governments take notice. Funding authorities take notice. This is why the clinical driver, the medical driver is so important, but the possibilities for technology transfer are also there all the time. And uh, the both fortunate and unfortunate fact is that the commercial field is dominated by glucose. Uh, about 75% of the sales of biosensors is glucose, so uh, you tend to get rather stuck in this uh, uh, glucose niche and forget the hundreds of other things you can measure with biosensors, which we need to bring out uh, today. But just staying with glucose for a little bit, because it is an amazing story, um, this uh, uh, illustrates the, the first uh, biosensors that we saw from Leyland C. Clark, the idea that you could take an oxygen electrode, you could immobilize on it an oxidase, and uh, then you would turn your oxygen electrode from something that sensed oxygen to something that sensed the substrate of the enzyme. And just before this session, I saw a paper exactly on 
that um, uh, uh, subject. Uh, with a, so uh, this, this is a very sound and continuing uh, strategy uh, forward. And uh, Leyland C. Clark, in his paper in 1962, described this approach, uh, and he described both the consumption of oxygen as a way of monitoring things, and he described the detection of the production of hydrogen peroxide at the Sydney Port Platinum Electrode. Now, what we did in the 80s was a relatively small step scientifically, but it turned out to have a major effect uh, commercially, and that was we substituted the oxygen with a, some chemistry, and we ended up using a mediator, which and biochemistry, we might be more familiar uh, as a, uh, with the term artificial electron acceptor. So uh, we used an artificial electron acceptor, if you like, that was electrochemically active to shuttle the electrons from an enzyme, a key enzyme, glucose oxidase from Aspergillus niger, to an electrode to deliver a current in response to the substrate. And the example here was glucose oxidase, but you can put many or most oxidase into the system and get a current out and directly link the enzyme to the electrode uh, and thus get away from the effects of oxygen on the system uh, and get a more uh, direct coupling. And this was the, the original paper in 84 and as I mentioned the commercial device was launched in 1987 and became a huge s success and it's basically the approach that's used by nearly all glucose sensors around the world uh, today. Uh, the chemistry, uh, this was the original paper by the way, and the original uh, device. The chemistry was one thing, but another very important aspect of this uh, invention was the idea of mass production. Because until we did our work uh, with mediators, all biosensors were handmade. There were commercial devices out there. They were about this sort of size, uh, and they were lab instruments for decentralized analysis uh, in clinics uh, and other places uh, for um, uh, especially diabetes. But by you introducing the chemical mediator, we were able to also come up with new ways to manufacture devices and in particular, we adapted the approach of screen printing to mass produce enzyme electrodes. So uh, we introduced this idea, which took us from uh, commercial devices being made by a team of 30 people sitting at tables hand fabricating to machine production with, in this case, a flatbed printer, but also reel-to-reel -reel or web printing, which is a bit like when you see a newspaper being printed. The thing just runs through and billions of devices can be produced, and that was what was necessary. We, the, the average company now, make, or the bigger companies now, making glucose sensors make about two billion sensors a year. So you needed this mass production uh, facility. Now, one of the things that uh, was a delight when I came to Sweden was to find myself plonked in the National Facility for Printed Electronics, which is based on our Norrköping campus uh, of Linköping University. And there we have all this lovely machinery, which I'd been used to making biosensors with, but I discovered my colleagues there were making electronics and solar panels and so on using the same sort of technology. So it wasn't a great leap of imagination to say, well, hold on, perhaps we can fuse these two technologies together. And we've developed an approach along the lines of hybrid printed electronics, where we print not only the sensors, but the circuitry, the power source, the display, uh, and a, a little bit of silicon there, which is the hybrid part, to make uh, very simple, inexpensive devices for sensing. And this shows the sort of device, and uh, uh, if you want to chat to me afterwards, I don't think there's any questions in this session, but I can show you some of the real devices here uh, on a piece of paper, um, which is a whole analytical instrument on uh, a piece of paper. And you see here uh, a set of sensors in this case. This part is clipped off in the final device. It's for programming the chip, um, and you can do amperometry, potentiometry, cyclic voltammetry, uh, you can measure gases, oxygen, so on and so forth with this uh, type of approach.
And we build it up just like we built up my sensors uh, in the early days. We start with uh, a, a P dot layer for the display. We then print another layer, which is the electrolyte for the display, another layer, which is uh, the digits for the display in this case. Then we print a silver layer for the circuitry. We mount some chips with an automated uh, um, uh, pick and place machinery. Um, we then print the sensors, the biosensors that we'd done before. We print the battery, uh, and uh, then we print the graphical overlay on the top. Now, this isn't meant to be a finished instrument. This is just to show you what you can have on here. You don't have to have a display. You can put an RFID antenna in there, send the message to a local area network, or send it to your mobile phone. Um, you don't have to have five sensors there. You can have 10 or one. You don't have to have the whole thing disposable. You can reuse the sensors, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a platform demonstrator. But going forward with that platform demonstration, we actually, this is the very first device we made, um, and uh, we showed it live uh, at the World Congress on Biosensors in 2014 in Australia, and this was just shot with my mobile phone. So it's not a, a professional image, uh, but it gives you uh, an idea of um, the, uh, the, oh dear, now I've got to come out of laser mode to do this, I think. Uh, uh, how do I do this? Uh, yes, I seem to have done it now. Here we go. So um, we, uh, we, we start by switching the device on with the printed switch, uh, and uh, then uh, we see the uh, indicator coming up here looking for a sample, uh, and then the sample is going to be applied over here. Um, and uh, then we wait for a while whilst we do uh, chronoamperometry inside the device, and then the display will come up shortly uh, with the uh, answer there, 3.5 millimolar, uh, looking at serum glucose uh, in this case. So an entirely paper printed device. Now the form factor for this can be varied in various uh, uh, approaches. You can make it much smaller maybe for certain animals, and uh, you can make it as wearable or a sticky patch or elastoplast. Um, you can uh, uh, put it on packaging for uh, developing countries and so that the pharmaceutical has the an analytical tool printed on the package and you can make the measurements to go along with the treatment. So a number of different possibilities. Taking a slightly sideways step, but staying with the story of what's happened in medical monitoring with glucose, Leyland C. Clark, back in 1962, had a vision. He had a vision of continuous in-body, in vivo monitoring. It's what he wanted to do. It took a long time. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't, wasn't until 1982 that we saw the first realistic research publication of a needle-type glucose sensor for subcutaneous monitoring of glucose. And it wasn't until 2005 that we saw the first devices available to people with diabetes. But they are now there. We saw Medtronic, the heart pacemaker company, launch the first uh, subcutaneously implanted device, and that is Bluetoothing the uh, result to a wearable uh, meter and giving you, con for the first time, continuous uh, glucose monitoring, body glucose monitoring, and that was followed shortly afterwards by uh, Dexcom, and then sometimes afterwards by uh, the big company, the big giant Abbott, uh, with their device. But it's Dexcom and Medtronic that have really been the most successful with these implantable devices. Now, notice at the bottom that if you're familiar with uh, having diabetes or with people that have diabetes, you'll know that the usual method is the finger stick method, where you prick your finger, get a sample of blood, and put it on the device. And these devices had to be checked by doing the finger stick method as well uh, as monitoring continuously before you adjusted your insulin dose. So technically we could see the possibilities of coupling this to an insulin pump, but it was not permitted by the regulatory authorities. But then we've seen a series of steps towards a very exciting realization just this spring of uh, complete control of the insulin dosing with these implantable sensors.
So first of all, we had the sensor augmented pump system uh, where we had the message going to a pump, but then you had to intervene with a finger stick. Then some degree of automation was approved in 2012, first in Europe and then in the States, where you could send the message to the insulin pump and the insulin pump would shut off if you were at risk of hypoglycemia. Um, so going into a glycemic coma due to low uh, blood sugar level and this of course is one of the biggest fears of those people using insulin pumps that they overdo it overdo the control and drop into hyperglycemic coma and then very excitingly we've seen just this spring uh, the first limited cohort of people using automated systems to control the basal insulin delivery so we're now really can say I think we have the artificial pancreas um, which has been a, a very long long road uh, to get there. Another interesting technological development has been a hybrid of the two, somewhere between the finger stick and the continuous monitoring, the Abbott Freestyle Libra, which is uh, described as a filament. It's just a nice description of a needle, really. Uh, and it's uh, worn in the arm, uh, and you can swipe it and get your glucose level whenever you want it. This is a, another relatively new introduction. First uh, uh, got its CE mark in 2000. 2014 and is now available on the National Health in Sweden. It's not in England yet, uh, not in the UK, uh, but is very, very popular with uh, people in Sweden with diabetes, with type 1 diabetes, uh, for continuous monitoring. So I talked a lot about glucose, but let's, I don't want to, uh, I want to now dispel the idea that it's all about glucose. <laughs> there are many, many other things you can measure with biosensors. Staying with the clinical field, for example, here was a, a very important introduction way back in 1992, the first silicon-based biosensor, uh, and it was a chip for point of care, decentralized critical care analysis, and this is the list of parameters that you can measure with this chip based handheld device. So some very valuable physiological and ecological uh, parameters already available there in this uh, portable uh, device. Then, moving on to some of the latest research literature that we see out there, there's a couple of papers from uh, the November, December 2016, and you can see the state of the art of the development of these devices. As one or two caveats, I'm a little bit critical about some of the detail here in terms of the physiology that these devices are used for, but the technology is undoubtedly uh, state of the art, where we have flexible printed electronics. Electronics uh, with a wearable device measuring in sweat in this case lactate, pyruvate, uh, glucose, uh, and uh, iron selective electrodes for uh, potassium, sodium, uh, and pH uh, measurement in a wearable uh, device. And then uh, this, this is a uh, 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 gal in the uh, in the U.S. Uh, and. Uh, then over on the right, we have the idea of sweat sensing coupled with drug delivery. So in this case, there's a thermally responsive polymer and uh, microneedles, uh, and uh, when uh, the sensing suggests that the uh, uh, <coughs> drug needs to be de delivered, then the polymer can be, the nature of the polymer can be automatically altered and the drug delivered through the microneedles. So we see some exciting possibilities here for new portable wearable devices. Now, I wanted to draw a parallel here in your minds. If you're getting bored and going to sleep and saying this isn't relevant to me, um, let me just show one of the emerging opportunities that is uh, looking very exciting at the moment. For years, process monitoring and process control has been a tough cookie or a tough nut to crack for biosensors because of the extreme uh, um, uh, 
robustness uh, and reliability that's required in process monitoring. And some of the same restraints uh, apply in environmental monitoring or marine monitoring and so on. Um, but uh, one of the things that's happened in process monitoring is the advent of cell culture and regenerative medicine and biologics, which is now demanding much more sensitive control, much more precise control of cell cultures. And so we now see, or I see anyway, many parallels between the in vivo monitoring of humans and the needs for cell culture, both in terms of generating uh, cells for uh, stem cells and cells for implantation and regenerative medicine, but also in creating the right environments to, for cells to produce uh, the uh, important therapeutic materials, monoclonal antibodies, replacement therapies and so on, and in the case of cells for therapy, T cells, mesokinal stem cells, B lymphocytes and, and, and so on. And we see this because you're dealing with many of the same things that you're dealing with in ecosystems. You're dealing with uh, the cells directly and the organisms directly evolving proteomes, uh, adapting to their environment, uh, and much more complex control and monitoring being required. So I think there's a lot of scope here for learning lessons from uh, the medical field. There are already biosensors available off the shelf for process monitoring, and this is uh, just one company, actually the original company to launch uh, biosensors commercially, the Yellow Springs Instrument Company, which has all this technology hand-fabricated, hand as I mentioned earlier, but able to measure a wide range of targets here. So we already can buy off the shelf uh, quite a shopping list of things to measure with biosensors, and we have a septic sampling systems that allow us to couple them uh, to uh, various uh, uh, cell culture systems. Cells themselves have also been used very effectively in biosensors, and this is an area that, again, your fields can contribute to. One of the most successful and one of the oldest environmental biosensors is for biochemical oxygen demand, where you're simply looking at the uh, uptake of oxygen of assimilable, in the presence of assimilable carbon and monitoring that as a way of controlling waste streams and giving early warnings of uh, contamination from factory effluents. And uh, these systems are in commercial use. Uh, they're, of course, a much bigger type of automated system here. This is one uh, Spanish, commercial Spanish system uh, from Biosensores. Um, and we see the sort of uh, commercial application here. We see 16 systems, for instance, in place at Portland Airport uh, to look at de-icing runoff and to give warnings of contamination of the environment. And this is the sort of appearances by sensors looking very different to the gluca handheld glucose sensor, but uh, this is the, uh, the sort of system that we see uh, there. Switching again from this, from the catalytic systems that I've been talking about, uh, and switching uh, from electrochemistry now to optics, uh, here is the very important surface plasma resonance approach uh, that was uh, first published by my colleagues at Linsherping, Ingemar Lundström, uh, Klaus Nylander, and uh, Bo Liedberg. Uh, and uh, this was the idea of using plain polarized light being totally internally reflected and exciting the free electrons in uh, a, a metal layer and looking at the uh, resonance, the plasmon resonance of those electrons in response to refractive index changes uh, at the surface of uh, this thin metal layer or semiconductor layer can also be used here. And when the energy is absorbed, you see uh, the light energy that's reflected uh, being uh, decreasing and you get these dips in reflection reflected light intensity, and this responds to, for instance, antibodies binding antigen, or single-stranded DNA binding its complementary strand, or a cell receptor binding uh, its target. And the uh, Biocor, uh, which was commercialized here in Sweden by a uh, subsidiary from Pharmacia, and later bought by GE, uh, they coined this term, the sensogram, where you could in real time measure these binding interactions. And that 
that was a hugely valuable research tool, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. And although the sales of this instrument are relatively modest, about $100 million a year, um, the impact on drug discovery has been huge. Now, this is a 200,000 US dollar uh, instrument, so it's a pretty expensive acquisition. But uh, colleagues have been working on miniaturizing this device as well. And this is uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Daniel Filippini and Lin Xiaoping, and he has put the whole device uh, onto a mobile phone, uh, onto an iPhone. And he's used 3D printing to create the cell and the plasma resonance chip. He's using the light source. Uh, from the uh, uh, illumination of the display and the camera as the detector and created a portable, simple, easy-to-use surface plasma resonance device for uh, affinity monitoring. It's about one-tenth of the sensitivity of the $200,000 instrument, but for many environmental uh, applications, that's quite interesting. We, for instance, use surface plasma resonance to uh, measure algal toxins. We've used it to measure measure endocrine disruptors, we've used it to measure pesticides and contamination. Um, there's really quite a wide range of uh, affinity elements you can incorporate and use for environmental monitoring. Another very convenient technology uh, for your use for affinity monitoring and uh, uh, that can be coupled with antibodies, with aptomers, with uh, single-stranded uh, uh, single DNA or for looking for uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, for example, uh, in organisms uh, is... Uh, and. Um, uh, most recently, uh, 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 various forms of RNA um, and, then, uh, and microRNA uh, the, the, is, is the idea of lateral flow assays. And you'll be familiar with these from the pregnancy test uh, idea, where you get this simple uh, chromatographic, immunochromatographic approach on a disposable strip, uh, which uh, can be read with one line or two lines uh, and giving you an indication of. Uh, the binding of the antibody or the other affinity element, and most commonly nowadays, uh, nano, uh, a gold nanoparticles used as the labels, although originally it was blue latex uh, that was uh, the label. Um, and this technology was for years kept uh, exclusively for pregnancy monitoring because the patents were held by Unipath, a subsidiary of Unilever, and we weren't able to uh, use it for other applications, at least commercially, uh, but uh, those patents expired relatively recently and now there's a burst of activity 20 years later of using this for all sorts of uh, uh, applications. There's a lot of work in Thailand for instance on shrimp uh, pathogen detection. There's work on uh, 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 various biomarkers uh, that can be put into this simple format. But you can also instrument this. Here's a rather crowd-pleasing uh, approach to instrumentation. Not necessarily the, the best one but one that caught the popular press again. Um, with the idea of using Google Glass to read the strips, but you can also automate it with a number of uh, readers and uh, get uh, an electronic output from this uh, type of sensing approach. Another technology that's had huge impact on the area recently has been nanotechnology and nanomaterials. And we see some illustrations here, gold nanoparticles of various forms for localized surface plasma resonance, dendromers and, and uh, um uh, carbon nanotubes, graphene, quantum dots, uh, carbon nanowires are all abound in the literature uh, at the moment. But let me just highlight a couple of approaches. Uh, first of all, an approach actually invented here in Sweden, not at my university, but at Lund University by Klaus Mosbach in the uh, 60s, was the idea of molecular imprinting. And the idea here is to try to get something more robust than an antibody. Antibodies are great, but they're relatively difficult to produce, a bit inhomogeneous, and uh, comparatively labile. So could we make something much more stable with the same properties? And the idea uh, Klaus Mosbach had was uh, non-covalent imprinting, where you assembled functional monomers around a target analyte, polymerized the polymer, and then got a cavity which had the right shape and the right 
chemical functionalities to bind the target, a bit like an antibody. And so these are sometimes called plastic antibodies. They're polymers with affinity interactions. Now this was discovered or, and, and, and talked about in the 70s, but it's taken a while to make reliable materials based on this sort of idea. And some work from my old team uh, in Cranfield, and now uh, commercialized by MIP Diagnostics in Leicester, uh, is the idea of a continuous reactor that can make molecularly imprinted nanoparticles, about 30 nanometers in diameter, that are soluble, behave just like antibodies, uh, but um, stable like a plastic, can be boiled, steam sterilized, and so on and so forth. So these have uh, many interesting possibilities in terms of for instance, absorbing pollutants in solid phase extraction cartridges and also directly in sensors. Another material or new material is the idea of hybrid materials which are part biological, part polymeric part artificial, if you like. And we've had an aspiration for some years to create synthetic proteins. And this is one step on the road here where we've created polymerizable amino acids uh, and then uh, developed, uh, polymerized them to make a, a, a polymeric material which is sensitive, highly uh, specific to and sensitive to copper determination and then facilitates copper mediated binding of proteins like a biological receptor uh, and we're putting this forward as a general approach to make uh, a new uh, re biohybrid receptors based on protein recognition but using synthetic polymers. Oh, excuse me. Again, playing with the idea of polymers, uh, we've looked at the challenge of affinity sensors. Now, one of the problems with affinity sensors is if you've got good affinity of, say, an antibody and you put it on a sensor, when the sensor binds its target, then it's very difficult to clean it off again. And there are protocols with things like the BACOR and the surface plasma resonance, but you tend to damage the antibody uh, because you have to have quite extremes of ionic strength, pH, and so on to get the antibody to release its antigen. So in this approach, we've used a smart polymer, uh, which changes st uh, 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 st uh, it, its state on some mild condition, such as a simple switch in temperature from 25 degrees to 32 degrees, and it changes its configuration and effectively throws off the antigen uh, from the antibody. So you get a reversible immunosensor uh, that you can just flip backwards and forwards by changing the temperature. And we demonstrated this on gold nanoparticles and you using localized surface plasma resonance, which gives you actually spectrophotometric changes, color changes, as opposed to having to use the more complex instrumentation. So an exciting approach to reversible immunosensors. Now, coming perhaps slightly touching a, a note with uh, uh, some others in the audience here, uh, we have uh, another copolymer with spiropyran, this time to produce a light switchable polymer. And the idea here is that we can change the state of the polymer on exposure to light and open up and shut off a sensing uh, device. So we can have a device in the off state then shine light on it and get a sensor response. This is responding uh, in this taste to glucose uh, with a pyroloquinolene quinone glucose dehydrogenase, but it can be uh, virtually any uh, oxidoreductase coupled into this system. So we have now a chance to back off and modulate a system molecularly, not just switching off the si on and off the signal, but actually modulating the signal in real time. Now that has some powerful possibilities. I'll illustrate that in a moment uh, when uh, I uh, get to talk about Stefan Hell's work uh, for which he got the Nobel Prize recently. But what I want to then move on to lastly in this talk is the idea of single molecule sensors. Uh, 
Now, if you're an analytical chemist, the challenge of me measuring single molecules is perhaps the ultimate challenge for biochemistry and biological systems. And if you think about it, single molecule sensing is very powerful because if you're counting single molecules, you're really doing things in an entirely new quantitative way because molecular counting is absolute and therefore calibration free. Now, to biologists, that sounds strange, calibration free, but we have here the potential for an absolute measurement. Not only that, but if you're measuring single molecules, you can look at the differences between molecules. And this is key for many biological processes. We so often just talk about the, the average, and it's the same story with personalized medicine. The average of molecules is not the real knowledge. The real knowledge is the difference between biological molecule behavior. So we can distinguish rare and unusual events from the noise associated from average measurements. And we could also look at inter- and intramolecular events in much more detail. Fascinating from an analytical perspective, the signal to noise, or the formal limit of detection, is no longer concentration dependent if you're counting molecules. And the last one, which is a bit difficult to get your head around, but the receptor design, in a sense, and now focuses much less on the specificity of that molecule, but more on its actual behavior, because you're actually now monitoring what's happening to the molecule in real time, as opposed to just looking at an average. So you can reveal much more detailed information and design things in a different way. Now, the idea of single molecule sensing goes back a long way to patch clamp and the, the ideas here and the, another Nobel Prize uh, for the work of uh, Sackman and uh, Nea in the 70s, awarded in 1991 for the, the patch clamp technique of electrically recording the opening and closing of channels uh, in response to uh, uh, the uh, uh, single events at those channels. More recently, I had the pleasure of sharing the stage with Stefan Hill uh, in uh, uh, Tampere in Finland uh, last month, uh, and he gave a lovely talk about his uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, STED uh, microscopy technology, uh, stimulated emission depletion microscopy for single molecule detection. And here he tells the story of how he broke the limits of optical microscopy uh, being limited by the wavelength of light by modulating the source that he was looking at by switching on and off fluorescence. And this is why the switching on and off is so important for uh, resolution. And at the heart of STEM is the ability to uh, control uh, the emission, uh, the, the fluorescence, and to, to get that resolution by uh, flipping between uh, states of fluorescence. Now, it had been single molecule detection then was there with optical techniques and fairly <coughs> complex instrumentation, but we aspired to doing it more simply and using electrochemistry for single molecule detection. And of course, I wouldn't be telling you about it if we hadn't succeeded and succeeded very recently. Uh, so I'd like to tell you in this last part of my talk then about this, uh, these latest results. And we lent on the shoulders of some great uh, innovators. Uh, Alan Bard uh, had shown already that you could detect single inorganic particles as a result of their catalysis when they collided at a microelectrode. So you've got a burst of electron transfer due to catalysis of an inorganic particle, uh, and, and you could see that either uh, as a spike, uh, as the particle hit and then left, or as a, a staircase type effect when the particle resided at the surface, continued to catalyze a reaction, an oxidoreductase reaction, and, uh, or, sorry, a redox reaction, and uh, you got the continued electron transfer and increasing electron transfer as other particles stuck to the surface. Then this work was followed by Richard Compton in, in Oxford, who showed that you could also look at 
silver nanoparticles and the complete oxidation of a single nanoparticle with many silver ions producing a spike of current when that collided uh, with an electrode. So we reasoned that maybe we could do this with biological molecules and uh, we chose for the example uh, lacase, uh, the enzyme lacase, and we were hoping then to be able to see when the lacase collided with a microelectrode in the right orientation, the uh, reduction of oxygen to water and the subsequent current that came uh, from that. And I said at the beginning my title was the simplest of instrumentation and here is the simplest of instrumentation. Uh, this was uh, my PhD student, uh, Alina Secretaryova, who did this work painstakingly, uh, covered her uh, Faraday cage in egg boxes uh, to insulate from noise and from uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation and from heat changes, uh, and, but a very simple setup here and conventional uh, electrochemical instrumentation. Uh, and uh, uh, one caveat was you could only do this at the weekends when nobody else was in the lab, but we were able to find single molecule interactions when the lacets collided with a 100 micron gold microelectrode in the right orientation, uh, then uh, we could see uh, the reduction of oxygen. And these are the spikes of reduction of oxygen and then a nice biological experiment we uh, introduce the inhibitor for lacase here and we see the spikes disappear obviously we had to accumulate quite a lot of uh, evidence for this and I can't show all of it today uh, to get published in the uh, Journal of American Chemical Society uh, but um, uh, this, this is some of the evidence there we were also able to calculate very fascinatingly the electron the turnover number of the individual molecules. So we are now able to resolve the difference between different lacase molecules, and they're not all the same. It's not the turnover number. It is each molecule has a turnover number, and there is a distribution of turnover numbers. Uh, and we can then calculate this distribution and look at the heterogeneities uh, in uh, the uh, population of enzyme molecules. Moreover, we can change the voltages and look at the different electron transfer sites in the lacase molecule. So we can look at intermolecular transfer from the T1 site, but also intramolecular transfer between the redox sites uh, in the enzyme. And so again, we can probe both the real behavior and differences in each individual uh, mole biological molecule, uh, but also design systems that can take advantage of these differences. So um, that was, uh, that was, as I say, published in JAX at the end of last year, but uh, you can you know when you've published something interesting because other people start attacking you and uh, so we had quite a lot of comeback on this uh, 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 approach and uh, there was a, a subsequent paper and then we've answered with a subsequent paper uh, in ACS Catalysis uh, and uh, some uh, issues have been raised um, which uh, I should, oh, oh sorry I've got one more uh, slide there just to show you the uh, pH obviously another nice biological experiment changing the pH and showing uh, the difference between pH 4, pH 5, pH 6 and pH 7.4 uh, with the pH optimum giving us the spikes and, the, uh, and then the rate diminishing with the other pH uh, levels. So just to end with some of the issues this is a, I think an exciting new area we hope to pursue it and we hope others will pursue it too. There is now one other paper uh, confirming our uh, approach in the, in the literature uh, and we have some debates now out there in the literature. Um, first of all, that it's been said that our turnover numbers are not compatible with the previous turnover numbers in the literature. But then, of course, you would
would expect that uh, because, first of all, uh, we're not looking at the average anymore. We're looking at individual events. And uh, we're also looking at the most active molecules and the best orientated molecules. But also, when you compare, you have to compare like with like. So there's been comparison with uh, enzyme from different organisms and so on. And of course, it behaves differently. And also, uh, the, the comparisons with enzymes with different redox potentials. And again, this leads to differences. It's been said that our spike-shaped response is contradictory, but we believe this is very compatible with denaturation of the protein when it touches the gold. So we only get a spike for a certain length of time before the enzyme is denatured at the gold surface. And there's other criticisms about the uh, using michaelis menten kinetics for this, but again, we have uh, a rather different situation when we're looking at individual molecules. So you can see all these arguments. I won't, I'm running out of time, so I won't go into all of them now, but uh, if you're interested in this, you can follow it uh, in ACS Catalysis and the uh, ping pong between us and uh, uh, the other authors uh, on, this, uh, on this matter. Uh, but whoever's right, I think it's an interesting technique. So I'll conclude now uh, by uh, a, a few overall statements. I hope that I've illustrated to you today then that a, a frictionless approach to sensing, this free flow of information, would supplement the accumulation of big data with real-time measurements of living systems and their immediate environment, and there's incredible power in this approach. I hope I've also illustrated that there's a boom in new technology which you can adapt and use and wearable sensors for humans of course can also be adapted for animals, miniaturized and so on and there is also considerable appetite for accumulation of human information as well as environmental information. A bottleneck, partly at the moment, is uh, the availability of highly sensitive sensors that measure biochemical parameters. And these are essential for higher level algorithms for cell culture, personalized management, environmental control, and so on. But you can help here, because I see tons of interesting molecules, materials, and so on, that could be used with these approaches to make new sensing devices. And so finally, a plea for collaboration the importance of biosensors in clinical diagnostics, health management, research in life sciences is clear, but we've got to bring a lot of different people together, not only engineers, clinicians, and, uh, and, and uh, biologists, but actually also business people, because uh, to make these devices widely available, we've got to have interesting business models. So uh, there's just a few reviews there, but I, I won't go through them now. Uh, just Google... Tony Turner, biosensors, and you'll find all this, uh, all this stuff. And I'll just finish by saying thank you. And a little advert, there's some of these over by the information desk opposite the registration desk, which is the next World Congress on biosensors. It's the biggest event in the field. It was here, actually, last year. And we had a wonderful time. Uh, so if I've stimulated your interest at all, come along to Miami next year, please. Thank you very much.